All right, thanks everybody for joining us. We're gonna give everybody a couple minutes to load in, but I am gonna launch a poll, which just is gonna kind of gauge everybody's um, experience level or how you currently interact um, with a formal sensory panel. So if you get a chance to, to fill that out, that'd be awesome, just so we get a, a better idea of who we're talking to. Upstate New York, awesome. Probably getting kind of cold here. there now. It's actually nice. My my business partners are in Rochester and they oh, say okay. it's like 70. So Thomas, you're like enjoying it. It's actually warmer there than it is in San Diego right now. Wow. <laughs> 75, so crazy. All right. Oh, this is so wonderful. Argentina. Nice. I was supposed to go to Argentina this year. <laughs> it didn't go. Nice. Couple of them. Good, good. North Carolinans, Netherlands, nice. Awesome, well, thank you all for taking time today and um, hopefully we can uh, entertain you as well as educate you over the next hour. <laughs> um, I'm gonna end the poll. Um, looks like the majority of you um, participate in um, some fashion, which is awesome. So hopefully we can arm everybody with some tools on how to look at uh, more specifically fermentation attributes through your panel and some things that we do here internally as well. Um, awesome. So just some uh, housekeeping notes. If you have any questions, um, you can submit them throughout our talk today, but please use the, the Q&A function. Um, that's what I'll be monitoring. Um, if it's relevant to what we're speaking of in the moment, um, we'll try to, our best to answer the question. Otherwise, we'll save it to the end. Um, this recording of this webcast is also going to be used. It's also going to be found um, on the White Labs YouTube channel, which you'll get a link, um, I think, 24 hours after this um, through Zoom to access that as well. So thank you all for joining us today. More importantly, thank you, Lindsay. Um, my name is Eric Fowler, the education manager here at White Labs. For those of you who have not attended these before, um, for those of you that have, um, you've probably seen a lot of me over the last couple months. But Lindsay, did you want to introduce yourself, uh, who you are, and a little bit about your company? Sure, yeah. Uh, so my name is Lindsay Barr, and I am co founder and CSO of Draft Lab Sensory Software. Um, that our business was founded about five ish years ago. Uh, before that, I was the sensory program manager, I think uh, more formally, the sensory and consumer research specialist at New Belgium Brewing Company, where I stayed for uh, nearly 10 years. And uh, before that, I was educated at UC Davis um, and studied fermentation and beer, studied gluten-free beer, worked with Dr. Charlie Bamforth for a couple years and um, did my food, food science master's there. Before that, um, I was at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque and um, I studied biochemistry and molecular biology. So um, kind of have a bit of a background in all things fermentation and I'm a, a lover of fermented products across the board. Um, and, you know, Eric and I have known each other for a few years. I, we met when I was teaching the Siebel Sensory Panel Management course in San Diego and um, we just kind of became fast friends. So hopefully we can have a, a good conversation and, um, you know, be nerdy at the same time. <laughs> Always. It's never not nerdy when we have a Never not nerdy. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we're going to, again, we're going to be looking at viewing fermentation characteristics through a sensory panel, but whether you have a formalized sensory panel or not, I think there's going to be some aspects of this um, that you're, you're going to be able to apply to your production um, on the professional scale, or even if you're a home brewer, there's just some good aspects of uh, production and of finished goods that you should be looking at um and documenting hopefully we touch on that a little bit today but uh lindsay did you want to just do a brief overview of what some of the benefits of a sensory panel are um just in, in a very um macro view so not only looking at fermentation but what's what what's the need for a sensory panel and why should somebody have one 
Yeah, really, the benefits don't need to be so obscure as they have been. Um, I think a lot of folks get a little bit intimidated when kind of met with the objective of starting a sensory panel or thinking about how do we kind of uh, build a sensory program. And really, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do with sensory is just answer every day product and process questions. Um, so the benefit of having tasters, a group of tasters to help and aid in those decision making in that decision making process um, is, you know, human beings are also your consumers. And so they're closely related uh, to those who are your end user for your product. Um, and, you know, we're, we're available, um, you know, in, in any kind of brewery, you have people who are available, you don't have to purchase any kind of instrumentation to be able to run a, a sensory panel. Um, all you really need to do is uh, have a good idea of what kind of questions you're trying to answer. Most notably for what we're probably going to talk about today is uh, should we be releasing this product? Maybe how is this product uh, changing? How is, it, um, how is it progressing through fermentation? Maybe a little bit of product development. What kind of yeast strain should I use to get the flavors that I want? All of these are sensory based questions and are uh, most appropriately answered by a group of tasters. Um, so that's that's essentially the benefits of a sensory panel is being able to very directly and clearly, quickly, cheaply answer product and process questions in any kind of food or beverage facility. Yeah, and that's what's always interests me most about it is, um, you know, as we were talking about before logging on today, the, the last uh, webcast we did was with Pat Fahey of Cicerone and uh, he really emphasized um, the flavor profile of a finished product and not necessarily what ingredients or processes um, created it. But when, when you walk into a brewery um, of any size, you know, there's so much emphasis on uh, data points on hot side and the cellar. And often when, I, when I've asked um, a lot of different breweries what they do for sensory, it's not nearly as formalized or standardized as um, some of the other data points that they're getting um, on the production side. And, you know, we'll touch on that in a, in a couple slides here, but it's just, it's always interesting to me how you spend all of this work creating a product. And then as soon as it's done, it, it often, there's a huge disconnect and it just goes away. Like, oh, well, we can't do anything to manipulate it at that point. So it is what it is. Yep. Yep, it's uh, I see that pretty commonly, especially in larger businesses where uh, you're moving really quickly and you're kind of moving at scale. Uh, it's easy to kind of ha be tempted to lean on analytical measurements or, you know, maybe microbiological measurements um, to indicate flavor. But at the end of the day, sensory, microbiology, analytical, we're all measuring different things. And I've definitely heard the story many, many, many times. Well, this checks out perfectly analytically and this checks out in all other areas of quality control, but it doesn't taste right. Well, I mean, there are plenty of things that could go awry or maybe um, go go right that are really difficult to look at analytically. You, you potentially miss it. Um, really only human beings can give you a holistic impression of the flavor of the product and is, uh, you know, the sensory lab is therefore a legitimate entity and different from the other areas of kind of gathering information in your facility. So with that said, do you see a lot more variables when you're introducing people as your instrumentation for taking these measurements, right? If you run it through a uh, gas chromatograph, it's, you know, the standards are a little bit more defined on what you're measuring against. How do you equate that to people who have a lot of preferences and different preferences and different experiences? Yeah, um, well, a lot of that ends up kind of coming down to training. Um, I kind of take a bit of more of a liberal approach, meaning that, you know, I know that there is going to be a certain level of objectivity and we're all going to be sensitive to different attributes or different, um, uh, you know, we're going to be sensitive to our own internal biases. And that's really kind of no different than any kind of instrument. So it's kind of the, the panelists, or sorry, the panel leaders, uh, it's kind of up to them to be able to understand those different sources of bias and kind of account for them in the data that they're capturing um, and also train the panelists to do what they are uh, being tasked with doing. Um, that doesn't necessarily always look like attribute training. It could look like a bunch of different types of training, and maybe we can talk about that later. Um, but similar to how you would calibrate a pH meter, you have to calibrate 
a group of tasters to kind of get you the the information that you need and and if the question is an objective you kind of have to kind of try to squash that objectivity but at the same time we should also be able sorry subjectivity um <laughs> why is that a difficult thing <laughs> um so, but at the same time, we should also be celebrating our differences, uh, knowing that we're not all perceiving exactly the same thing. And um, over time, you'll be pretty surprised that eventually everybody kind of gets in line, especially as they get a lot of repetitions under their belt. Um, and, you know, you those panelists that are maybe sensitive to certain things will kind of come up to the fore and you know that you can maybe lean on their data when it comes to a certain attribute or, or not. Sure. Yeah, so, I mean, I think the next slide might be on lexicon, but standardizing um, that training and how people perceive different things and how they explain certain attributes is always really important. Um, I, I feel bad. I've used this example so many times. There's some brewer out there somewhere that's like, curse Eric for always using this. But, uh, you know, we had an issue a couple of years ago where somebody called and was complaining about a, a poor fermentation and saying it, it smelled like hot garbage. And kind of had an idea with what they meant, but you know, what, what aspects of fermentation characteristics should people be looking for and, and documenting and, and how do you, um, here, go to that next slide there, how do you even start developing that common language to communicate that? Because in this case, it was very difficult to help diagnose what the issue was without being able to taste that beer myself. You know, there was, a, a couple you know there's a couple options that you could say either way it looks like there probably wasn't many ways to manipulate that fermentation at that point to help save the beer but you know if if i'm running a panel and somebody says hot garbage that doesn't really do a lot um, for me because that's not part of our, our standard language mm -hmm. yeah um i mean I would argue, just to be a little contentious, <laughs> that um, being able to just flag a sample as being off for some reason, even though it may not, they may not be calling out, you know, a, the specific mercaptan that is causing the hot garbage aroma, is still useful information, especially for a, a production facility that's just go, 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 going. Um, so to have a rapid way of just knowing what the flavor profile is supposed to be and having the ability to say, hey, this isn't right, and maybe this is potentially why or what I'm experiencing is a good first step. It's a good first step in knowing, okay, well, we need to stop. Something may have happened. And you can start looking at your process to understand, well, maybe what happened during fermentation, what happened during maturation. Did we, you know, uh, add a moldy ingredient? You know, there, there's a bunch of things that you can kind of start doing. Doing, uh, but the first step is really being able to flag it, which is what they did. Um, but to go back to the lexicon kind of question, just where do you start? Uh, I think, thank you for putting a picture of the beer flavor map up there. I, I think that starting with a, a common language is, is definitely important. Um, and you know, anybody who's captured data, sensory data with like a text box or something like that knows the heartache and the pain <laughs> that one would go through to try to make sense of all of it, um, especially if people are all using the different language. And um, so what we were trying to do with the, the beer flavor map was just kind of present a approachable and standardized format for beer flavor. Um, and, and also in a format that kind of follows the different granular, like the granularity towards um, specific attributes or specific um, terms. And so kind of going from aroma, you can usually detect, okay, well, something might be fruity. I, if I have a beer next to my desk, I'm going to be using it. So <laughs> it, something might be fruity. All right. Well, that fruit might be more citrus like, okay, well by citrus, I mean grapefruit and maybe a little bit of lemon. And so it kind of helps you to pinpoint and identify what those aromas are without having to learn a new language entirely. So this is a really good first step at understanding uh, what that is. When they said hot garbage, um, it 
it's kind of up, in my opinion, it's kind of up to the analyst to be able to say, okay, well, garbage could mean certain recaptains and certain recaptains could come from aging or it could come from a, a long fermentations or it could come from poor yeast health. What generation was it? And so um, it's really, I don't want to bog the panelists down with having to know the origins um, of every attribute. I would just want them to be able to tell me when something's up <laughs> and then, and then uh, it's my job to figure out why. So what, uh, what's your take on using just a general flavor descriptor as opposed to the chemical name um, when working with the panel communicating? Yeah, I think that there is um, merit in both. And uh, what's, what's difficult is if you're tasked with starting a sensory program and you, know, you, you tell your boss and your boss's boss, yeah, I'll be able to start that program, but first I'm gonna need to train my panelists for 80 hours. I'm gonna have to buy food grade standards. I'm gonna have to use at least you know this much beer, get everybody in the same room and do this over and over and over again before we can get good good data out of them. That's that's gonna be a non-starter for many, for many panels. And so um, I think in some ways learning chemical names is useful for being able to kind of pinpoint and target problems in in the in the process and it also kind of it gives you a language that you didn't already have which is kind of nice it kind of opens up your your mind to um, different flavors which is kind of nice but it shouldn't be the first step in starting a sensory program um, as your program grows and as it develops then uh, you might want to focus a little bit more time on and attention on on knowing those different fermentation issues that could arise and training your panel on doing that. But I think a good first step is just to uh, get them to understand what should be there and validate that they can tell you when something isn't there. Uh, so yes, really starting with with the kind of on flavors, I think is useful. I've seen panels that um, have done nothing but attribute training. And I, you know, I, I did that too um, as a young sensory scientist, nothing but attribute training. And so the, the lexicon that your panelists know is just all riddled with off flavors. And then they end up using that language to build target descriptions. And you're like, is there really acetaldehyde in this product? I don't think there should be, right? But that's the language that you've given them. So I think, we really need to focus first on what should be there, validate that they can tell you when something's off. And then as you develop your panel, maybe integrate some more specific attributes into your um, panelist training. Yeah, that makes sense and um, resonates with my experience as well. We spent years with spreadsheets and mm -hmm. using flavor spikes and and it's it's what, you know, it's, it's what everybody gets excited about, right? Mm -hmm. It's what, especially if you already have that understanding of some of these compounds and you've maybe never been able to uh, try it on its own and that levels, you know, way above threshold. But when it comes to real world applications, it just didn't really, it didn't really get us very far. But we had a question come through mm -hmm. um, from Josh here, the thoughts of, and kind of related to what we're talking about, but thoughts on using panelists that are um, well in tune with a specific brand and it's, uh, it's essentially batch to batch or a target profile versus panelists that are well-rounded tasters, but not as intimate with the brand? Yeah, um, my first task when I started working for New Belgium was to drink fat tire every day. <laughs> and I thought that that was like the coolest thing ever. Yeah, it's tough. Uh, yeah, I'm like, okay, I think I can do that. And there was a lot of wisdom in that. And the wisdom came from like, just there's really no substitute for having familiarity with the product and being able to build your own internal idea of what's in and what's out of um, normal process variation. And to build that, you have to be pretty familiar with the brand. Um, you have to be like pretty, you know, you have to be able to build that, that idea of like what's in and what's out. So I do think that um, while it's really important that you have a lot of familiarity with the products that you're evaluating, um, that doesn't mean that somebody who isn't familiarity with the product yet can't be a valid taster. Um, I think it just takes, it does take a little while though to kind of get their feet under them. You can build a target description and you know, building a target description I think absolutely has to happen using the assessors that are going to be evaluating subsequent batches for adherence to that target so that it, it needs to be in their own language. Um, 
And so, you know, build that target description using all of the, the people that are going to be doing the assessments moving forward. And um, as you kind of get more repetitions under your belt, you'll have a more, uh, you'll have a more narrow and a better idea of what's in and what's out. Um, if you've built your idea of what this beer is supposed to taste like by only drinking six month old product, um, it's maybe not that accurate. So you have to kind of go back and, and taste multiple times of what fresh is supposed to taste like before you can really have a um, really solid grasp and understanding of what it's all about. So just mindfully evaluate and that can be, that can happen relatively quickly, um, but it definitely gets better over repetition. Yeah, um, you know, from our brewery standpoint, uh, that's almost a better question because, you know, our, we've got a 20 barrel brewery, but what we do is we do split batches and inoculate with different yeast strains. And we might brew a core IPA, but still use different yeast strains um, every batch. So it's difficult sometimes to build that brand profile and train to that when you're only brewing the same batch every six months and you know the hops are the same and the malt's the same but the yeast being a variable changes it so much so right. that balance for us in our panel which i'll get to in the next slide is, can be very difficult right so your objective is maybe a little bit different than like a, a production facility that's like churning out the same product over and over and so the the panelist training that you would apply is maybe going to be with with that lens so you have to kind of develop their lexicon and and keep their their minds open and so but somebody who's in a production facility might want to do trainings that are a little bit more targeted on really understanding brand profiles um, so it can change based on what your objective is but either way you're you're using flavor analysis to answer those questions mm -hmm. um, so maybe we could talk a little bit now on um sensory panel and the relationship with the lab, right? Um, I think there's a, a lot of harmony and a lot of the data. One thing that we've done um, throughout um, COVID is it made um, a concentrated effort on um, consolidating our, our data because we have all of these different people, all these different departments that have great information, but as a, a partner in this industry to a lot of breweries as a, a supplier, we use our brewery a lot of times to R&D the products that we're about to release and share that information with people. So what we've done is we've spent a lot of time getting the buy-in from these different departments and creating one master spreadsheet where everybody can go and look at, you know, the fermentation timeline, the pH drop, and, you know, what strain was pitched, what the temperatures were, what days, combined with the analytical data, combined with the sensory data. So now we can see the large picture of, okay, what actually made this beer? Because if I'm putting it on tap, you know, I ran it through panel, I tasted this, I'm only seeing the beer when it's done, but what's the communication look like or what should it look like throughout that whole process to all of these different departments? Um, what should panel maybe know um, ahead of time that they should look for that maybe is flagged from something that comes out from analytical data or a fermentation profile that maybe seemed off? Yeah. Uh, wow, there was a lot there, and I like it. Um, to answer that last question immediately. You got like 35 more minutes. You're good. Okay, yeah. Let's to answer that first question immediately, um, I would say the less a panel knows about the fermentation, the better. Um, it's, it's really easy to be biased, and we want to be right more than we want to be accurate, and that's how human nature is. Um, and so what they'll do is they'll end up looking for something that might not actually be there. Um, if they know that something kind of went wrong. So I often say that some of your best panelists are those who aren't in production. Uh, they're kind of in accounting or marketing or wherever. And they have no idea going into what the panel is going to, to look like, um, you know, what the, the samples are that they're going to be drinking um, or evaluating. So I think the less they know, the better. <laughs> um, other than so to answer that that question, um, that's that's that quick answer. Um, I also love the concept of that big master spreadsheet and the idea that you guys are really focused mostly on R and D. So having the ability to 
associate flavors with fermentation profiles or yeast strains or um, pitch rate or whatever is incredibly important because you end up having brewers coming to you asking, how do I use this product uh, to get maybe a, a bigger banana flavor? And you can look back at that information, at, at your sensory information, see where you've seen banana um, and, um, you know, maybe look at those tags. If you're using Draft Lab, um, you can, you know, tag all of those samples with all of those parameters. So you can, you know, search for a parameter like uh, X pitch rate and see what kind of flavors come up. Um, so there's, there's real power in being able to make product development decisions by just associating data from various sources with your, with your sensory information. So I think that that's really super duper cool. However, um, I sp spun my wheels for a long time trying to make analytical and sensory data correlate. And it turns out they're not, they're just not going to correlate. <laughs> like there are some rare instances where they do correlate, like with VDKs, with diastole, um, which I think we're going to talk about now, like thresholds and stuff. Um, so there are some rare occasions where they do care correlate relatively well. Um, but ultimately, um, you're, you're measuring different things in, in the sensory world. So um, when you can really pair those two data sets to make a decision, that's kind of where you've just hit the jackpot. So for example, um, when we were producing at New Belgium Slow Ride, that was kind of the, the session IPA. And the first time that we did, um, that we used a, a, a different kind of process for dry hopping, um, dry hopping with like active fermenting yeast um, we chose to do that because we knew that we wanted tropical flavors and we knew that the way to get that was by targeting these certain analytes that we knew would be caused from fermenting with yeast uh, or sorry fermenting with hops um, so that's kind of an example of how you know sensory drives process decisions and analytical can verify it and help to kind of you know, direct it, but we might be just blah, blah, blah. I'm not sure how many people on this call um, have analytical chemistry capabilities. <laughs> sure. Uh, but, you know, I, I think it is, um, uh, obviously, I think it's interesting, but, you know, a lot of times the way that my experience is, is, you know, we'll run something through panel. And this is usually an aged product at that point that there wasn't a lot of diacetyl when we first put it on tap. We're fortunate that well, we don't really distribute. So, you know, we've done a couple canning runs that go to like three bottle shops and that's mm -hmm. it. So we have a lot of control over our product. Um, but, you know, over time, we've seen a diacetyl spike only to go back and look at the analytical data and see, okay, the, the total diacetyl is above threshold, whereas we didn't taste that for the first two months. So mm -hmm. through aging and oxidation, um, that precursor was obviously converted. So, you know, the, the case study that I put up here is kind of an interesting one because um, it really shows beer style too. And then we can touch on another question in just a second um, regarding to um, attribute training in, in the specific base beer. But we had an imperial stout, so it's a, a very large beer, um, it, very high finishing gravity, essentially pastry stout. But it, you know, looking at the uh, diacetyl as is in total, we do force diacetyl and everything too, but that's, you know, in the brew house. So that's more to determine when we're going to um, crash the beer, transfer to a conditioning tank. <clears throat> but we saw here that, you know, total as is was, you know, let's say 30 PPB. So below threshold in a very light beer um, or just about there. Uh, but generally not an issue, but total meaning that that precursor plus diacetyl was above threshold to some people in certain products. Um, so noted that there was potential for diacetyl, but in the product that we were trying in that moment, the amount of diacetyl was below the general accepted threshold. So what we did was, um, again, we've never brewed this beer before. Uh, it was brewed right at the start of COVID, um, we took a lot of our specialty grains that were probably going to go bad. We knew we were going to tank space for a while. So we said, let's brew a massive imperial stout and let it age for a couple months. So we didn't have a, a target um, to test against, right? Everything we ran through was the first time anybody's trying this beer. So how did we know if it was right? What are we looking for? Um, 
are we looking for diacetyl? Well, we kind of knew the intention of the beer was to not have diacetyl. So if anything was there, that was gonna be a negative, but there was no specific call out to diacetyl or anything that we could lean towards that using the descriptive test. And this was all pulled uh, from draft lab as well. So the next step for us was to develop a brand target so that we could continue um, shelf life testing for that. Um, but you know, being that it's a large imperial stout, even if it's gonna hit that 60, 70 PPB, there's a good chance that we're not really gonna be able to specifically call out diacetyl because there's so much else going on in that beer. Um, could you maybe touch on your experience with um, specific compounds like that in different beer styles and, and how it would be uh, deviate from that, that target profile? Yeah, I think diacetyl is a really good example um, where, you know, thresholds, thresholds are kind of funny to me because it's, it's a little arbitrary and really dependent on beer styles. Um, and so threshold testing to me is just like, I, I probably did it maybe two or three times in my time at New Belgium. And uh, one time that we did a threshold test was to answer a very specific question. And it was to answer, when should we be crashing our tanks uh, to get them to get the low enough to get diacetyl to be low enough under perception. Um, and it's a bit of a balance, right? Because if you keep that beer on yeast for a long, for much longer, you're just going to diminish your yeast health and you're going to get, you know, less, less, um, you know, potential pitches out of it. So we wanted to really kind of hit that perfect spot um, for, you know, specific flavors. And so for, for an Imperial Stout, you might be crashing your tank at like, you know, 80 or 90, and that's maybe fine. Um, but for maybe a light lager, you're probably going to want to wait until 30 or 20, maybe. Um, so it's all a little bit of a balance. Um, so I think diacetyl is a really good example. And it's a great, it's kind of a really great example of how um, analytical and sensory can work well together. If you're actually looking at, at an analytical marker, diacetyl is such a wonderful compound because it is, a, a perfect analytical marker to track the health of your fermentation. So if your curves are starting to get a little wacky, if like fermentation is slowing, you have that, that marker that you only need to be looking at that one thing and it's gonna tell you pretty much everything you need to know about your yeast health, um, which I just think is so cool. Um, and it, it kind of helps you understand where to, to crash your tanks as well. So um, yeah, I think, I think, did I answer your question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So do you think, uh, like, what are your thoughts on using sensory um, before maturation? So like, you know, yeah. looking at like performing that forced diacetyl test is a form of sensory. Who generally does that fall on? And how do you suggest documenting that? Like who, who yeah. should give the go or no go? And should there be a more established process? Or is it as simple as somebody spinning down a sample and cooking it and then smelling it side by side saying, let's go ahead and crash it. Yeah. Um, if you don't have a lab, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that that, that is a legitimate method that a lot of people use and it works. I mean, that's at the end of the day, it works well. Um, so I think that that's a perfectly legit method. I think the only thing that you need to really be sure of is that the the assessor, because usually it's one or two assessors, um, can smell and taste diacetyl. And they can taste it through, you know, everything else that you just did by cooking your beer, because it's, it's not exactly an accurate representation of what it's going to taste like when you're done fermenting, but it at least gives you an idea if like your precursor is, but it has been converted. Um, so that's, I think that's a perfectly legitimate method. As far as in-process tastings go, it's probably maybe one of the only ones that I would hang my hat on um, because it's, if you're tasting in during fermentation or really even at the beginning of maturation, the question that you're answer, like trying to answer is, is this beer going to be okay when it's done fermenting and, you know, filtered centrifuge and in a package. And that's kind of a crazy question to answer. You, you can't, <laughs> you can't extrapolate any further out. And so what you're doing is you're really looking for kind of egregious issues. You're looking for fermentation problems. You're looking for maybe the absence of a flavor that should be there. 
um, maybe color issues, something like that, but you're not going to be really sussing out the nuances of the flavor development in a, in a maturation tasting. Um, so really that's one of the only tastings that I think is legitimate at that stage. Awesome and agreed. Um, aside from looking at your yeast and just knowing raw ingredients too, right? Mm -hmm. um, so when you're, so the question in the comments here, um, when you're training panelists by using spikes, do you prefer using consistent uh, macro logger as a control or brands the panelists will be uh, actually encountering the panel? So, yeah. you know, tainting your brands and how would you suggest doing that, whether it's through spikes or blending or any yeah. other methods? Um, first of all, hi, Josh. <laughs> Good to see you. Thanks for the question. Um, I am a big believer of using your own brands. Unless you are a macro lager producer, um, I think you need to use your own brands because it's it's all going to come out a little bit differently in different in different brand profiles. And so, um, I think you know use the the beer that you sell the most of and do flavor trainings with using that. Um, additionally, you kind of don't want your to get really complacent. So if you're going to do attribute training, maybe put the same attribute in uh, your top seller and then your maybe second seller, tech, second top seller and see how it manifests in those different, in those different products. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a believer of just getting as close to the decisions that you're going to make in your facility as possible, meaning use your own beer when you're doing flavor trainings of any sort. So in the case of diacetyl, um, would you then be looking at, you know, tainting your existing top selling brand and seeing if somebody like, how would you look to be able to identify if somebody is blind to it or had a very low threshold so that you ensure that they weren't the ones making that uh, go or no go final decision on things? Because right, what is it? You probably know better than me, but like 10% of people are uh, completely blind to diacetyl and I've you know, encountered quite a bit of people and worked with people on our panel before. Mm -hmm. We kind of knew to isolate that person's, um, you know, mm -hmm. feedback based off of what we were looking for. Yeah, yeah. If you're just screening for someone's ability to to smell it, um, then I would spike it at a high level. Um, and I would still use your products unless like your main product was like an Imperial Stout and you would have to add like 200 ppb or something to like get panelists to smell it um but i would still spike it at a relatively high level and just over time either see if they can call it out or not um this is actually a, a probably a good way uh, uh an appropriate use of like a threshold test um but not a threshold test like if you actually look up if you google asbc threshold test don't do that because <laughs> it's you're going to be really mad at me because it takes a really long time and it's not really worth it um for what you're trying to do in this specific case yeah, but sucks. um <laughs> yeah i mean you could simply do like you know maybe a triangle test this is again one of those really rare cases where a triangle test makes a lot of sense um where you know you just spike uh, diacetyl at like a high, high level. Um, cause you're just seeing, can you even smell it? Um, if you're blind to it, you will not be able to, to smell it. So maybe, uh, have two samples that don't have it and one that does and see if they can pick it out and see if they can do that repeatedly. Um, and over time you'll be able to understand if, if they're, if they're capable of doing that. Um, so there's a number of ways of doing that, but actually the triangle test kind of makes a little bit of sense for, for that specific question. Awesome. Uh, so, you know, looking at how we utilize um, sensory too, and this is something that you and I have had a lot of fun over the years talking about because it's very unique and our challenges are very unique, especially when looking at some of the R&D projects that we've been working on um, and working with similar products that just have slight deviations due to, you know, the yeast strain. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we utilize the same base beer with two different yeast strains, uh, which helps us again, kind of isolate and deduce how the strain affected the flavor and aroma. So, you know, the differences we've seen um, aren't necessarily saying that the yeast produced all these differences, but interacted with the other ingredients to produce that, um, which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool. I love that you guys can just like split batches and then see the impact. Like with the one on the right, you get a little bit more tropical like the tropical citrus balance kind of switches between the two. So that gives you really interesting information that you can relay back to your brewery partners. 
Yeah, and what um, you know, I could have showed on here too is some of the differences in um, you know, perceived bitterness and alcohol and all that, because that definitely changes as we pick strains with different attenuation rates and you know the sweetness levels, the appearance, and and all that changes based on um, how we're finding the beer and processing it too. So it's you know while we're looking at aroma here, it's uh, we see it um, throughout other aspects of the, the finished product too, which is really cool. And it's cool to be able to um, pinpoint that a little bit, right? Because yeah. a lot of times um, we can explain the difference between these strains and how they interacted in a specific beer. But being able to visualize it, I think, has um, really helped identify what makes these different. Because again, looking at the analytical data um, is great, but we're, we're there's a lot of intangibles that you're you're getting out of it, right? Like, what's the essence of the beer with all of these things working, interacting together, and creating this matrix of what the finished beer is? And then also, just at the end of the day, which one do you like more? You know, I think that's something that we shy away from, um, you know, which is not always a bad thing because there's different examples and, and say different strains used in different recipes and fermented at different temperatures and different pitch rates and all that. But um, at the end of the day, which I think is the, a nice segue to our next slide here, maybe not a couple slides from now, uh, is uh, looking at, you know, what are your, what are your customers think and just how much generally do they like um, the beer. I think we touched on attribute yeah. training a lot, so I'm going to kind of yeah, skip through that. Um, yeah, do you want to go, do you want to just segue to consumer stuff and then go back? Yeah, sounds great. Um, so, you know, an, an example that I use a lot is the difference between drinking and tasting. Um, I think a lot of people in this industry this is going to sound like everybody's an alcoholic, but a lot of people drink a lot and not many people taste a lot. Um, and, you know, I'm myself included in that. If it's a long day and it's a beer that you're very familiar with, you know, it's, it's not uh, unsurprising that you get home and you open it and you don't think about it. You know, maybe you don't even pour it in a glass and you just enjoy it. And that's totally okay. But your customers, a lot of times are tasting your beer quite a bit. And when something's off, you know, there's a lot of people really loyal to specific beers and they order the same thing when they come in two, three times a week. Mm -hmm. And one of, the, one of the experiences that and you've maybe told, heard me tell this story before, but one of the experiences I had that have, have always stuck with me was the first brewery I was working for uh, was the small nano brewery. And I wish I knew now what I, you know, back then, because there's so many mistakes that I learned the hard way, but we were at uh, it was San Diego Beer Week about 10 years ago at this point, and um, Jamil Zanishev was was down and talking to everybody, and he had some beers, and he said, what are you drinking? And I said, you know, I'm drinking whatever this new beer is from a brewery down the street. He said, oh, you're not drinking your own beer? And I said, no, why would I drink my own beer? I get that for free. Like, I'm out at a bar. I want to try somebody else's beer. And he said, you should always try your own beer, because how are you going to know what your customers are tasting? how it's pouring from somebody else's draft tower, how they stored that keg, you know? And it just, it made me feel very small and it was very humbling. <laughs> and, and I never forgot it because it, it was, I was cocky, right? I was thinking that I already know what that beer tastes like. Why would I need to try it? And he was completely right that, you know, your customers are going to probably know your beer, how it tastes better than you because you're not even trying it um, in mm -hmm. the field. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Sure. But also we don't need to be sciencing flavor all the time. Like we can also yeah. just be drinking our friend's beer because we like our friend's beer. Sure. And there's no judgment there. <laughs> yeah. And I'm uh, sure there was more uh, nuance to the conversation than just. Sure. But know. it does make sense. It does make a lot of sense to just kind of do your own field quality and have an understanding about how your beer is aging in the market. Um, that's, and it's also kind of fun, you know, you get to go to your local pub and see how it's pouring there or, you know, pick up a six pack and see how it's doing on the shelves. Um, shelf life analysis, I think is totally legitimate and it's, you know, good to get a read of what people are also experiencing in the market. Um, and the, you know, what they are experiencing is really just how much do they like it and, you know, making those knee jerk reactions. I do think that we should give consumers a little bit more credit than they have been given because they are quite savvy 
and um, especially the beer consumer, there's a lot of nerds out there that <laughs> that really kind of understand beer flavor and they can detect nuances um, with flavor changes and it has an impact on their overall liking. Um, so yeah, I, I like saying like uh, the population approach is helpful to paint a lar larger picture. Um, you know, there's, when you're answering the question, should we be releasing this beer? It's best done by your internal panel to understand if you're releasing it. But if the question is, um, you know, maybe what should we make next? It, it's accurate. It's more accurate to get a read from your population to understand what they want. Um, and if you're okay, uh, using your own kind of hedonic interpretation of the product as well, then that, that the question gets um, flipped to be more, more um, in line with liking perception. So instead of speaking jargony, um, it's, it's best to ask consumers, what do you like? Um, and here, here's a beer, do you like it? And how much do you like it? And maybe what are the attributes that are in it so that you can get a, a clear understanding of what your population likes and, and why? And that's a legitimate question to ask your consumers. And uh, could you talk a little bit about sample ox and uh, how that is utilized as a tool to help gauge a lot of consumer preferences and um, you know maybe some ways that that could be useful because it's something that you know we've worked with you on for almost a year now probably and yeah and, um, I think there's a lot of benefit to you know using tools whether it's that or even um, a piece of paper across the bar it's just you know my yeah. experiences um, even with running the internal panel is when you ask people to start filling out pieces of paper, just the tracking that data just takes so long and analyzing yeah. it just becomes so difficult and tedious that you don't really end up with a lot of um, usable results. So maybe you could touch on yeah. some of the work you've done to help make that easier for everybody. Yeah, Eric was an early adopter of sample ox. And so we, we had like some, some fun conversations initially in its development. Um, sample ox is our consumer research platform. Um, and it kind of fulfills a couple of different objectives. First of all, to engage your consumers. Um, consumer research is really difficult to do if it's going to be like this long arduous process and you know that's when you end up having to pay consumers and and it gets kind of a little bit muddied um, but what we're trying to do is is make this a fun experience for your consumers while the brewery is able to get useful information to help inform product product and process development um, and so what we do is ultimately, you know, every consumer research question in my time doing this can ultimately be boiled down to two things. What do your consumers like and why do they like it? That's kind of like the, the two main things that you need to answer and the two main things that your consumers are capable of telling you, capable of telling you. And so um, to answer those questions, we just ask people, how much do you like it? on this zero to nine point scale, how much do you like it? And then uh, what are those attributes that are in it using that common lexicon uh, that we talked about with that, the beer flavor map. And so from there, you are able to get really actionable information around consumer liking and um, the attributes that drive that liking. And then if you can correlate what kind of process or um, recipe parameters you used for that product, you can then you know, use those parameters moving forward to make something that you have confidence in um, that is going to be liked and approachable by, by your consumers. Um, and at the same time, consumers feel good about being engaged in a way with their breweries um, by giving you good feedback and useful feedback. They also are able to learn a little bit more about themselves. They get their data back to them and they can see what the population is also saying about, about the product without just having it be an open text box, right? Because it can be really hard to interpret that. So um, kind of guiding them in, in that that check all that apply approach through the app um, helps to see overlaps in what people are perceiving and um, be able to correlate that with their overall liking. And it's fun. <laughs> yeah, from our perspective, it's it's a very interesting tool that we haven't been able to use to its um, full capability yet with all the shutdowns. Uh, but, you know, doing two yeast strains side by side, it's what I'm most interested in seeing over time is 
and what their preference is and why and how that relates to um, sometimes the way, like the marketing side of it, right? Does, does the score they're giving it and how much they like this beer correlate with sales? And our people often, because we're, we're dividing our beer up, so we've got our Tabor IPA, which is our house IPA, with WLP001 California Ale East and WLP008 East Coast Ale East. They're both awesome beers, but people are more familiar with California Ale East. It's, you know, it creates flavors that they're very familiar with. It's a name that they recognize. They've probably used it in beers if they've uh, been around brewing at all. So people are often a default to what they like. So I've been most interested to see A, how what people's preferences are between the strains side by side and B, does that correlate with um, consumer habits and what they're actually ordering at the end of the day? Um, is, are they ordering based off of familiarity or are they ordering based off of what they like the most? And, and those yeast strains change it a lot, but I think there's um, a psychology behind it too that can give us some insight. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, they're purchasing is such a multifactorial decision <laughs> um, and you know marketing goes into it the you know the the setting um, just kind of season whatever there's a lot of different factors that kind of go into that um, but you know with, with sample ox the, yeah, I think you kind of touched on the the additional benefit of being able to relay back to the consumer what they said about the beer in your marketing. Um, you know, internally you might call something caramely, but the consumer might call it vanilla and it's going to be so much more powerful um, from a purchase perspective to print the word vanilla on your package rather than caramel or whatever I just used because it resonates with the consumer. You know that you're using their same language and you know that it's uh, an attribute that correlates with liking. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. When it comes to, you know, fermentation, influence characteristics too it's interesting to see you know how much people are actually picking up and whether it matters to them and how it matters to them because you know it's easy to get down the rabbit hole but at the end of the day explaining something in layman's terms that they're going to understand and that resonates with them um, I think it's a really cool tool that helps uh, bring one more step into the psyche of the people that are actually drinking the beer and, and drinking the yeast strains. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes we get so caught up in the B2B side of communications and, and speaking with people that are similarly experienced. And mm -hmm. it's often easy to lose sight of, well, you know, how does this, how does this yeast strain make the beer taste? And what do people think of that? Because at the end of the day, you know, you can know how to use it and know how to manipulate it and produce exactly what you want on paper. But if your consumer doesn't like that aspect um, of what the yeast is contributing, you know, maybe it's time to choose a different yeast strain or, or manipulate it in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> uh, all right. So to wrap things up, I guess we can go talk about, uh, we can wrap it up with some questions and then talk about uh, target profiles. But I think we touched on that a little bit. Um, you know, fermentation can affect every aspect of beer from mouthfeel to perceived bitterness and aroma. We spent a lot of time today talking about aroma and flavor, but I think there are um, a lot of other characteristics of a beer that are defined um, by other ingredients and processes, but um, fermentation contributions as well. And um, as we can touch on now, but documenting the positives and negatives of a brand in batch deviations using a panel, I think is uh, really what we try to use and, and what we use it for, for our, um, our R&D projects, you know, batch deviations is great, but when you're not brewing the same thing very often, it's difficult, but doing that we're changing one ingredient or one process, um, trying to document what people like and don't like about it, I think has been very beneficial. And then just generally, you know, sensory panels, a, a great tool in assessing quality, um, and the fermentation contribution of a, a new yeast strain. Um, you know, anytime you're changing a process or using a new ingredient, documenting it and documenting again what you like and don't like about it. Um, so you have something to reference. It's always really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think if nothing else, um, 
having the ability to kind of build a database of the flavors that you've experienced and um, the, the products that those flavors are correlated with is a really good way of just getting started um, and having that data work for you over time. So as you continue to capture more sensory data, um, and you know, you'll, you'll be able to kind of build that knowledge base and you can kind of utilize that to make decisions for future brands and be able to detect maybe problems that have been kind of underlying in the process. Um, you know, as, as you continue to develop the program and as you can continue to uh, develop your senses, you'll be able to, and your, your database, you'll be able to make more targeted decisions about the flavors that you're producing. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, so we'll get to some of the Q and A in just a second, but I um, again wanted to say that this recording will be available on our YouTube channel um, probably sometime tomorrow within 24 hours. And then next month, um, this is a monthly series. We're going to be doing it throughout 2021 as well. Um, December 16th, um, we'll be doing 2020 year in review with uh, Chris White, the founder of White Labs, and really just looking at all the craziness that happened this year. Uh, but hopefully being able to take some of the positives and, and some of the cool things that are coming down the pipeline um, for White Labs, but for our industry as a whole. So if you have any questions, use the Q&A box. Um, one of the questions we have here is, is there a minimum training scheme to be able to say my panel's ready and when they can trust it? So how do you validate a panelist essentially? Yeah. Um... So what I like to, again, it kind of, you know, you're going to hate this, but it kind of depends on the main question that you're trying to answer. And if it's, um, can, I, can I accurately release product to the market and be confident that my panelists are giving me um, good, good information? If that's your main question, then um, I simply like to uh, run a bunch of true to target tests. And we didn't talk about this in too much detail, uh, but essentially once you build that brand profile that Eric talked about um, from that tasting data using the description test, um, and you can, you can use that profile to measure subsequent batches next to. So you can taste that, that next batch against that profile if that batch is within or outside of the brand profile, you can make decisions accordingly. And so, um, and that's done by the true to target test, which is simply just, is the beer that or is it not? Here's the target, is it that or is it not? Yes, no, um, kind of binary decision-making and it's, it's useful. Um, and so what I like to do to validate a panel for that specific question is to maybe throw in a, a couple of products that that accurately represent true to target and maybe one or two that are out of target. So maybe a six month beer um, in, that, in that same category and see if they can flag that as not being true to target or see if they can flag something that maybe you spiked a little diacetyl in or maybe see if they can catch something that has a little bit of your porter blended in with your lager. Um, like see if, if they can kind of catch these little de deviations. Uh, from norm and it can be anywhere from like a, a slight deviation to like a big one and if they can't catch the big ones um, then kind of retrain them and retrain them and it's it's a pretty simple retraining um, you know you can do this over zoom maybe send your panelists home with like six cans that represent you know three true to target and three maybe not true to target and then after they do their true to target analysis you can tell them okay pick up sample number four that was not true to target because it's a completely different beer sample five that is not true to target recalibrate yourself on that because it's a six month version of what you're supposed to be tasting and so it can be pretty simple um, just depending on what your your question is awesome and well, thank you all for the kind words yeah, um, if you don't mind, I'm going to put, I know that we're almost at, at our hour, so um, I'm going to put the website for Sample Ox up. I know we got a question about what that was, so I'll put that website, and I just did it. So if you cool. want to check out Sample Ox, which is um, our consumer research platform, you can reach out to us there. You can always reach out to me as well. Um, 
which is my email address is Lindsay, my name, L-I-N-D-S-A-Y at draftlab.com. Uh, or you can reach out to any of us at info at draftlab.com. And um, I'm happy to sit down and, and hop on a Zoom call with you and maybe talk through what your specific questions are, what your panel is up to. Um, and, you know, we can have a nice little 30 minute consultation. So anybody who's interested in that, just reach out to me directly and we can hop on a call and we can talk out any questions that you have. Awesome. What a uh, last question. What beer did you have next to you? Oh, uh, that was uh, Burgeon's IPA. Oh, awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, All right. I don't know. <laughs> I, you know, I needed to do an Insta post. <laughs> uh, I was like going it's... for it. All right. Yeah, I got to the point with a lot of these, especially when they're like on the East Coast and stuff and early in the morning where yeah. I'm just yeah. like, I'm sorry. I can't. I can't. I'll, I'll, take, <laughs> I'll take a few sips, but um, I, I'll just fall asleep. So, and I need yeah, to still do some still more got work. the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it was, a, it was a pleasure having you on here. And I always appreciate uh, geeking out with you. So thanks for yeah. taking time. And um, hopefully we can do it again sometime soon. And better yet, have, have a beer in person and, and geek out some more. Totally. One of these days. <laughs> thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, thank you hosting. all for joining. All right. Thanks, Lindsay. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. See ya. Bye. Bye.